Oh, hello people. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm using OBS. I usually use the other thing, XSplit, but it refused to install for some reason. So I'm trying OBS. I think I tried OBS before and it didn't work well. I can't remember why. And I just heard myself, so it sounds like everything is good. All right, Falter Visor Q and A. Right. Okay. So, first of all, what is Falter Visor? Falter Visor is a. Uh, let's see. Boop, 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 boop. Falter Visor is a. Um, I guess, I don't know how to describe it best. It's a hypervisor for closing instrumentation and, uh, what else? Code coverage. Right. And Fulcrovisor, uh, currently relies on being an AMD system. Uh, I initially started out working for an Intel system, and I've since changed uh, solely due to AMD being a little bit easier to write uh, for. So I'm just going to make some few notes here. So it was initially called Brownie, which was a uh, Windows uh, snapshotting user mode based hypervisor buzzer. Uh, this was initially Intel's VPX. And then Brownie V2 was a Windows dot 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 dot, same thing, but this was a uh, buzzer thingy for AMD's uh, SDM. Then we got to Fulker Visor, which was a um, cross OS, I don't know, cross whatever you would call it, um, uh, OS level buzzer. And then, uh, slowly as we went through this, we added support for code coverage, um, memory coverage, which is uh, absolute and relative, and I'm going to go through these. Um, what else have I added in here? Uh, debugging, single stepping, um, networking is something to go into as well. I'm just kind of making notes here of like uh, the core principles. So, um, you now if I click out of this box, I'm going to lose all these settings. Uh, okay, maybe I should just use Vim. I'm going to set up Vim sets, GUI fonts, terminal H12. That should be big enough to see. And then I'm going to set that up. Fault Airvisor here. And I just got to change that screen. Properties. And this. Okay. That font might be a little too small. I don't know how that's going to look. We shall see. Alright. I'm just waiting for this to come up on the other end to see how it looks in terms of size. Alright, so uh, Brownie was interesting as it started out as uh, it was kind of a guess that I could snapshot a Windows application and then run it under a hypervisor. It didn't technically need to be a hypervisor since it was user mode. And then I would simply go about emulating all the system calls under it rather than bringing the whole kernel with. So this was... Uh, uh, it started out as a debugger for Windows, um, and when I say debugger, I just mean it used like the Windows debug help API and friends uh, for snapshotting uh, register and memory states of an app. Okay, and then once I took a snapshot of a uh, running application, now, it should have worked for other platforms, but I never got to making a snapshotter for Linux, so it always only worked for Windows. Um, then what I would do is load up snapshots in a uh, Intel v VTX VM. 
All right, so now I've loaded up all of the memory states and register states in a um, VM. And at this point, I would just modify memory and then execute. It's about as simple as you can get when it comes to like an application running under a hypervisor. Um, and uh, this is initially how it all started out. So I thought this would be the easiest way, the lightest weight way, that way you're not snapshotting the kernel and all the other applications on the system. You're simply picking up one application and resuming it from where you started it. Um, and this has many different problems that I started getting into. I started implementing little syscalls here and there for um, reading files, writing files, registry key, all sorts of accesses like that. But I ended up running into problems where uh, it would start doing uh, system calls to get information about the system, uh, like memory state, other applications running, which sound, sounds fine and dandy, but now I have to emulate all that information. So I would have to set up a fake environment, and then I would also have to support some undocumented syscalls, and especially enumerations in those syscalls. So you might have like, uh, query process information, and then in that syscall itself, you have, you know, 50, 100 ways, however many ways that you can query information and query information on different things. Uh, and what's really frustrating about that is I would have to reverse out all of those different uh, syscalls to emulate them correctly, or emulate them incorrectly, or drop them on the floor with an error and hope that the application didn't care or rely on that information. Uh, so one thing you're going to notice as I'm kind of going through the architecture of a lot of this stuff is uh, I usually implement the bare minimum to get going by. If I think I can get by with dropping a syscall on the floor by erroring out or skipping over a function that I don't like or I don't support, um, I'll totally try and do it and see if it works. So I definitely do not take the approach of I need to do every single thing and then I'm going to implement all those things. I'm simply just going to very quickly uh, try something out, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So if there's a chance that I'm going to get false positives, I'll try it. If I don't get any results anyways, I don't really care about false positives because I can't have any if I have no results in the first place. Okay, so uh, first question I got is, is Fulcrovisor open source? It currently is not. And there are many reasons for that. I've mentioned them before. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is, first of all, the code quality is mediocre. It is tied down to one system uh, running one of three network cards, and it requires another server on a network uh, with a hard-coded MAC address and IP. Obviously, you could change that, but it'd be frustrating. I'm just giving a sense of how very specific this is implemented. Uh, and then a custom file server that serves up files to that system and receives results from the systems. Um, obviously, if I polished all these things, I could potentially release it, and that's something I'm considering uh, moving forward. Uh, another problem currently, which will eventually change, is that um, the uh, current setup is not really modular at all. It's kind of my initial Falk OS with the hypervisor bolted on top, and then I have fuzzers that are kind of integrated inside the code itself. They're not even in separate files, it's just kind of all in one ball. And um, if I were to remove the fuzzers from it, I would be relatively comfortable releasing it. I think it's cool to have a debugger and instrumentation tool that would be open source. Right now, it's a little bit of a worry because those fuzzers are directly integrated with it, and running it in its default configuration would be able to find some bugs that are uh, relatively dangerous and have not been patched yet. So once those bugs, bugs get patched, or I remove that, those fuzzers from uh, Fulkervisor, I'd potentially be interested in releasing it. Um, so we'll see if, if that's something that I actually want to end up doing. Uh, it definitely sounds interesting. I'm trying to do these Q&As because I'm trying to get a feel for the community and, and if they want a tool like this, what they're interested in, how I should change it before I release it, if I do ever release it. So based on how some of these sessions go, and hopefully maybe I'll get to do some talks on it, uh, we'll get to see whether or not um, I go open source with it, which I would I would like doing. I, I really haven't open sourced anything. This is kind of my first big project that's lasted for more than a few months. So, uh, so that's kind of the gist of why it's currently not open source, um, but we're kind of heading that, in that direction. So I got another thing. Uh, 
Some person in Twitch chat, must be a really weird person, said I was going over 80 columns. I noticed that. That's fine. Deal with it. You're a 120 person anyways, I think. And then someone else asked, uh, Falk Advisor is hard to pin down on Google. What is it exactly? Um, so yes, I don't really have much uh, public information on Falk Advisor. I really was just kind of named at the last minute when some people joked about it, and I slapped the name on it and went with it. Um, but Bulk Advisor is, uh, uh, as I said at the start of the video, and I'll repeat it because people are joining, it is a, a uh, hypervisor that is kind of dedicated towards running snapshotted applications in a way that there's visibility into code coverage, memory coverage, register coverage, all kinds of different coverage information, uh, debugging, stepping, breakpoints, all these different things, uh, as well as very fast uh, restarting of the application. So I don't know if you guys saw recently there was something on Reddit NetSec where someone was saying like 10,000 execs per second in um, uh, what is it called? AFL. Uh, and I'll link that uh, in Folk Advisor on Freenode and somewhere else. And it was just uh, an interesting post someone made about uh, AFL and persistent mode. So I'm posting that in two different places here. Oops, uh, and Falk Advisor, sorry. Um, and basically, that was an interesting article because that was going through and saying, um, if you kind of uh, snapshot these applications, you can go, uh, or not necessarily snapshot. I'm, I'm not 100% sure how the persistent mode works, but I'm assuming that it starts from a, a particular point for faster fuzzing because, um, and it's a good point, like AFL is very good. I haven't done too much work with it myself, but I, from the little I've read from it and the code coverage it does, with the exception of the pretty strict limitations on the amount of blocks you can have, I think it's a pretty good concept. So Falkerizer kind of brings it to another level. And uh, so what I do is I'll snapshot an application, in this case, uh, in modern Folk Advisor, I'm not Brownie, I'm no longer snapshotting applications, I'm snapshotting the entirety of uh, Folk Advisor, uh, whatever's running under Folk Advisor. That could be the Linux kernel, that could be the Windows kernel, it could be a custom OS, uh, whatever runs on an AMD64 system. So once I'm running under, or once I've taken a snapshot of this, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go into the details of how these snapshots are done, so let me make a note. Um, and then, actually, I'm just going to go right in into the deep part. So the snapshots are done in kind of an interesting way. So the way Folk Advisor works is it's supposed to boot up whatever is running on the disk uh, kind of transparently. Now, right now, it only supports a single core. So you're not able to boot up in a multi-core system. Uh, you're going to have to disable down to one core. That's just a limitation I haven't gone through and edit all the AVIC support for um, multiple processors. That's a lot of extra work because now you have to basically wrangle all the other cores under the uh, hypervisor and uh, it's not incredibly difficult, I just haven't gotten to it yet. So once again I kind of take the shortest path to get things working as quickly as possible and going with one core is plenty fine uh, from the start. So first it uh, picks you boots fault hypervisor and all that's going to do is it's going to set up um, uh, I'm going to pixie boot over the network, it, they'll grab the Fulkervisor image, and then Fulkervisor is going to read the disk, and it's going to boot whatever's on the disk uh, pretty much transparently under Fulkervisor. So this will now uh, load up uh, boot sector on disk, and boot under Fulkervisor. So now I'm running in a context where uh, whatever OS was on the disk is now running under Fulkervisor. And I have a few different ways that I VM exit, and the uh, initial one is I put breakpoints on all of the BIOS uh, input and output, or not input and output, uh, software interrupts, because I need to emulate some of the software interrupts to convince it that I am uh, booting off of a normal system, booting from a disk rather than pixie booted. Because I have pixie booted, now I have to kind of cover up that fact. I'm not trying to cover it up to be stealthy, I'm trying to cover it up to convince Windows, hey, you need to fetch your contents from the disk and not uh, over the network. 
So, now I'm booted under Fulker Visor. Uh, once I get into protected mode, I don't need to worry about biosimulation anymore, and Windows is well aware at this point to read off of the disk. Uh, so at that point, I disable the software interrupt VM exits. Um, I then enable uh, hardware breakpoint VM exits. So then I monitor hardware breakpoints. Um, and depending on what I can get set up, I might be able to do a demo if someone asked. Uh, I would love to do that depending on how I can get my other computer showing up. Uh, I had a question of what keyboard do I have, and it is a DOS keyboard. I've had this keyboard for about four years, and it served me very well. Um, so now I have whatever OS running, and I'm monitoring hardware breakpoints. And what I'm going to be looking for is a hardware breakpoint that occurs uh, while another hardware breakpoint register contains a magic number. So in this case, um, the magic number is OX leet leet leet. And the reason it's three leets instead of four leets is because uh, debug registers must be a canon address uh, such that I can't do leet leet leet. Actually, I would have to do like a sign extended FFFF leet leet leet. Um, so I just go with leet leet leet. Um, basically, if is present in a debug register upon a hardware uh, hardware breakpoint. Take a snapshot of register states and memory and ship over the network. So this is really interesting the way that I did this. And what's cool is you can use whatever debugger you want. You can use GDB, you can use WinDebug, uh, you can use Ali if you can do hardware breakpoints. I don't know if you can or not. But this is my very generic way of, yeah, I know it's not sign extended to FFF leet leet leet. Um, but basically, if that is present, and it doesn't matter how you get that set up, uh, it will start the snapshot then. So this is my way of telling the hypervisor, hey, it's time to take a snapshot. So this is actually done from inside the guest by setting up these breakpoints. Uh, this way, you don't have to have something outside of the network that has to send uh, a network message at a perfect time. You don't need to really configure it. You just, you're physically running at the machine that's under Fulker Visor, all the hardware is passed through. You can use the monitor. You could play a video game in it if you want because the GPU is passed through. Um, and then you just make sure you set up the uh, whatever breakpoint where you want to start fuzzing, and then make sure that you set another debug register with this magic number. And it could be whatever you want, given you change it for the uh, hypervisor to expect it. So once that has occurred, it's going to save your register state. So on AMD, all your register state is stored in a structure called the VMCB, the Virtual Machine Control Block, if I'm not mistaken. So I save that off. There are some things that are not included in the VMCB, so I include those as well. Uh, those can be, I think, I think the debug registers are in there. Some control registers are conditionally saved. Um, so I basically make sure the conditional registers are saved. Uh, I also save some memory map information, such uh, as to like where the um, MMIO address ranges are, because that could change uh, from machine to machine. So I make it so that when you take a snapshot, you're able to bring it to another AMD machine, and it should run, given that the there are no like invalid instructions that will be running on the machine that are not supported on the one you brought it to. Um, then it will also take a snapshot of all the memory. Uh, this is kind of a, a work in progress. I initially had it where it was just snapshotting only, uh, it would just snapshot all the memory. Now I'm making it kind of differential where it only snapshots the memory that has been used or accessed. Um, and I might actually revert back to the old way, uh, mainly because I'm changing architecture and I'll make some notes on that in a bit as well. So uh, once I've generated this image, which is the register states and uh, FPU states and XMM and YMM states uh, and the memory state, then I send it over the network to my file server, which will then save this to disk. And that's all done over my own little stupid transfer protocol called bulk TP, bulk transfer protocol. Uh, it's really nothing special. It's just a UDP based um, uh, Transfer protocol it really is nothing special. There's there's nothing great about it. It has no features that TCP doesn't. Uh, it was just easier than writing a TCP stack that could integrate and talk with Windows um, or Linux. Now that my file server is on Linux, so 
At this point, I have a snapshot taken. If I want to, I can take another snapshot and it will just send the new snapshot over the uh, image um, or over the network. So uh, once the snapshot is done, uh, the hypervisor zooms. Oops. So well, what it will look like is basically you will go to create your snapshot, Windows or Linux, whatever, will kind of freeze for a few seconds while it reads all the memory and sends it over the network. Once the server has confirmed that it has successfully saved the snapshot, it will then resume whatever was running. Um, so now you're back into Windows and you can move your mouse again and type in the keyboard and you could go about making more and more snapshots, which is something I do. I'm going to make another note here, which is... Um, these are just kind of things that pop into my head. Uh, comparing results from different snapshots. So we'll get into that. Um, now feel free to take more snapshots. So that's kind of the snapshotting part. There's really nothing too special or complex there. Uh, I'm working on making it more differential. Uh, I just added early this week support for a bigger um, uh, uh, for bigger images. So before I could only handle like uh, four or eight gig size VM and I made it so now it can handle arbitrary size VMs. So I was running like a 256 gig VM um, just to kind of test it out. Uh, and the only way that I could do that is I had to add uh, IOMMU support, which I did earlier. And uh, now that all works flawlessly. Uh, and the reason I have to add IOMMU support for that is because now I cannot have a physically mapped um, identity mapped uh, guest, which is what I was previously doing. Um, so now I actually have to like allocate a page, put it into the guest uh, page tables and keep doing that. And a side effect of that is now the guest physical addresses are not the same as the actual physical addresses. So the IOMMU has to be able to translate DMA accesses from devices to the guest uh, addresses or from the guest addresses to the real physical addresses so it can do those. Um, so someone asks, uh, why do I need my own network protocol? Uh, and the reason for that is I like doing everything from scratch. So once again, uh, I guess I probably haven't mentioned it, but Fulkervisor is written entirely in uh, AMD64 assembly. It has no components from Linux, Windows, anything like that, such that the all of the drivers and devices that are supported in Fulkervisor have drivers written entirely by me. Uh, side effect to that is I don't get a TCP stack or a UDP stack or really any networking. All I can do is put, you know, packets out on the network. So I made a tiny little UDP stack because it's trivial. And then I made a, a stream based protocol on top of UDP rather than implementing the entire TCP stack as that's just uh, much more complex and difficult to do. So it's really just a time saving reason that I did that. Um, so I think that covers all the snapshots. And that's kind of the boring part, but um, really the only thing kind of unique and fun there that I did was the, the way that I uh, tell it how to do a snapshot, which is that hardware breakpoint, which is uh, kind of fun because it makes it cross-platform and it doesn't pin you down to using a certain protocol. You can just use whatever debugger you want that can set hardware breakpoints. You could write your own debugger if, if that's really what you want. Okay, now once you want to fuzz, uh, you're going to have to reboot whatever machine you took the snapshot on or bring the snapshot over to another machine. So, uh, Pixie boots Fulgervisor in fuzz mode. Uh, so, in snapshot mode. And these are just different versions of Fulgervisor that uh, you just uh, basically change a define and it's a completely different image that gets built depending on if you're snapshotting or if you're actually running it in fuzz mode. Um, so, uh, Pixie Boot Fulgervisor in fuzz mode, and all that's going to do is boot up to a black screen. There's nothing that gets printed out to the screen. And then Fulgervisor will uh, request uh, snapshot images over the network. So what's going to happen is it's just going to boot up, initialize all the hardware that it needs, set up all the virtual memory, all the different things that a standard OS is going to do. And then it's going to immediately just request over the network, 
hey, I'm, I'm booted up, I'm ready to do some work. Uh, can anyone give me a snapshot image to start doing some fuzzing from? So it will then pull these images over. Uh, the images can be arbitrarily sized. They used to be about four gigs a piece. Um, and then uh, Ultravisor fuzz module will also pull whatever needed. And when I say whatever needed, I mean, if you write a fuzzer and your fuzzer relies on a corpus of input data or uh, a bunch of information on how to mutate data or things to mutate data with, uh, it will pull it over at that stage as well. So once it's got all it needs over the network, it's then going to uh, all the cores on the system. In my case, I have a 64 core system with uh, eight NUMA nodes, uh, and that's not too relevant now, but it will be relevant later. Um, so each, each core is basically going to make a copy of the snapshot, and then it's going to load up, uh, or it's going to create a VM with the uh, with all the memory of the snapshot, it's going to clear out all the dirty flags of that system such that it's going to be running in a clean state, and then it is going to start executing that VM. So it is up to the uh, fuzzer. Um, uh, fuzzer must change memory uh, to change input. I what's a really good way to say that. Um, Basically, uh, Fuzzervisor is pretty dumb in terms of all it's going to do is pull that snapshot image, load it up into a VM, and start running it. Uh, so it's up to the fuzzer to, before it starts running that um, that image, it's going to need to, um, uh, let's see, before it starts running that, it is going to need to uh, mutate whatever's in the guest. So I have some like memory. Uh, memory management tools and functions that are used to manipulate guest uh, virtual memory. So it is kind of up to the fuzzer to directly change the guest memory to change the behavior. Uh, say you want to fuzz some image parser, load the image up into memory, call whatever function to parse the image, and you put the snapshot right, when, uh, right after you load the image into memory. And then in Fulcrovisor, you would directly zap in or modify that image in memory. Um, it has a lot of limitations, but it keeps things very quickly. So, uh, someone asked, how do I keep the snapshot uh, file size small? Um, right now, I, I don't do anything. I don't compress it. I don't uh, dedupe it. I don't get rid of pages that are just filled with zeros. So right now, I don't do anything to keep it small. The only way I keep it small is by making the guest have a smaller amount of physical memory, and that's it. Uh, so it's really not too fancy. Uh, then I was also asked, what is a NUMA node? So a NUMA node is a, I think it's non-unified memory area or something like that. I can't remember what it exactly stands for. Uh, but basically, uh, in my system, I have eight NUMA nodes, and each NUMA node has its own L3 cache, as well as its own memory controller. And uh, basically, different sticks of memory are attached to different NUMA nodes. So I basically have eight different eight different memory controllers hooked up to their own banks of memory. And by having the cores that are on that NUMA node access that node's memory, there's a lot less latency. For example, accessing your own node's uh, memory is about 150 cycles of latency, whereas accessing another node's memory, where you have to go over, um, crap, whatever the AMD uh, hypertransport, you have to go over to hypertransport bus, and now it's about 250 cycles. So you ideally want to only work with memory that is local to your node. Um, yeah, non-uniform. Yep, yep. Uh, okay. So uh, once the fuzzer has changed the memory input, uh, the uh, VM is launched. And that's pretty trivial. Now the VM is going to just keep running until it has hit an I.O. operation that it cannot handle because I do not emulate any devices, nor disk, nor display, nor anything. In the snapshot mode, I get all those things for free because I'm passing through the original hardware. But when I'm running in fuzz mode, I don't actually pass through any devices. And you might wonder, how the hell does any of this work if you don't give it a disk or you don't give it a display or anything like that? And the key to that is where you snapshot. So if you snapshot the right location or the right software, keep in mind some software this won't work well for, 
If you snapshot at the right location, you won't have anything displayed to the screen. You won't have any uh, disk access that is done. Um, and even on targets where there is disk access, writes will almost always succeed because they'll just be cached. Uh, so you'll just write to like some write queue and then you'll return up. So writes don't really matter and reads, most of the files that are going to be read are already cached such that it's not actually going to hit disk. So I really leverage that to make things work without having to implement a disk. So I'm able to fuzz things as complex as Word where I have you know 300,000 basic blocks of coverage without disk support because everything that it's touching, all the DLLs it's going to load, all the files it's going to load are already in cache. And since the cache is part of the uh, snapshot image, I get everything for free. So eventually I will need to implement disk support, but it's not something I do now. So VM ends execution on one of three conditions. So there's a timeout, and this is a configurable timeout of I don't want it to run for more than a second or two seconds or a minute, however long you want it to time out after. And that's just to make sure it doesn't get stuck in an infinite loop, which you very frequently hit. Um, IO access. So this is going to be disk, display, uh, context switch. Uh, context switch is going to hit uh, 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 the APIC and stuff, uh, which is going to cause a fault. Uh, not a fault that I'd report, but a fault that will cause me to terminate and try another fuzz case that hopefully doesn't hit I.O. And then another one is an actual uh, fault. So this is going to be um, uh, uh, memory violation, uh, etc. div by zero, all the different exceptions you can get. So the exceptions, I, I actually report every single different exception. So your GP faults, your page faults. Uh, your div by zero faults, your unaligned faults, your invalid opcode faults, all the different things. So those are basically one of the three conditions that uh, VM is going to end on. Um, if the VM ended on a fault, the uh, register state and input file are reported over the network. So basically, if I do get a fault, uh, then I'm going to take the register state and I'm also going to take the input file that caused us to hit this fault, and I'm going to send them over the network for them to be saved. I'm then going to try and reproduce these probably when I wake up in the morning and I see that I got a new crash, and once I get that, I'm going to be really happy. Uh, okay, so if the VM ended on a fault, yes. Cool, so this is... Uh, so that's kind of the core principle around the execution. There are a lot of cool intricacies that I'll go into, but I'm starting with a very uh, simple, uh, here are the basics. Then the next part, and this was the first biggest thing that I added to Fulcrovisor. I actually had this in Brownie as well, uh, even in the original version of Brownie. And this is, and I'm going to put in caps, differential restore, smiley face. So. Differential restore is when I'm going to revert the snapshot into, or revert the VM, not the snapshot, into its original state by only restoring pages that have the dirty flag present. So, only restore pages in the VM with the dirty flag set. Uh, so, if you're not familiar with, um, if you're not familiar with uh, internals of x86. Basically, you have your page tables, which is how you d translate the virtual memory to the physical memory. And in the case of VMs, you have NPT, nested page tables. And this is how you... Um, oh, sorry, I didn't know you could only see the 135. All right, scrolling down. Um, uh, so basically, you have the different page tables. And in this case, I have NPT, nested page tables. Uh, or EPT, extended page tables. I can't remember what they're called on different architectures. Um, but basically, this is how the guest physical addresses are translated into the host physical addresses. Now, whenever there is an operation that writes to one of these pages, the dirty flag is set on the smallest page. So if you're using 4K paging, the 4K page will have the dirty flag set. If you're using uh, 2 meg or 4 meg paging, then it gets set there, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, whereas the access bit, which will be set on any memory access, whether it be a read, write, or an execute, will be set on all levels in the tree. So what's really cool about this is uh, in 64-bit paging, you're going to have, um, uh, at the top, you're going to have 512 gig uh, pages. And then you're going to have 1 gig pages. And then you're going to have 2 meg pages. And then you're going to have your 4K pages. And I use 4K pages for all of the guests' uh, physical memory. It just makes it a little bit easier to uh, round around all the NMIO regions that I want to map out. Um, but say I write to this 4K page here. So if I were to write to this 4K page, what's going to happen is the processor is going to mark the access bit on the 512 gig page and here, as well as here. And then on this 4K page, it's going to mark the access bit and the dirty bit. So what I can very quickly do is I can go through each 512 gig region of memory on the system. And if the 512 gig region is not accessed, I don't care about it at all. And I can skip to the next 512 gigs. And I go through and through and through. And once I hit the first one that's accessed, I'm going to drill down into the 1 gig pages look for whichever ones are accessed there, into the 2 meg pages, whatever's accessed there, and in the 4K pages. And when, it, when I come across any page that has been marked as dirty, once again, I have to use the access for the, the higher level pages. But at the lowest level, any page that has been marked as dirty has been written to. Now, it might have had the same value written to it that it previously had. And I don't have a way of detecting that, nor is there a way of doing it fast enough that it is worthwhile trying to detect it. But if that dirty flag is set, then I'll revert only that 4K page. So if I have a 4 gig VM running in a um, uh, running under Falker visor, and I'm say, say I'm fuzzing an image parser, and that image parser touches a meg of memory, I'm not going to revert 4 gigs of memory. I'm going to revert only 1 meg of memory. Or if it's touching 1 meg of memory, but it's only writing to 10K of that, I'm only only write to a few page, or only restore a few pages, and uh, this is kind of a, a huge change. And I can't remember what the actual results are, but it essentially is like a 10 to 100 times speed up uh, by doing this. From uh, keep in mind, this is going from reverting entirely every time to doing these differential restores, and the 10 to 100 times speed up is absolutely nuts. Uh, it's it's huge, especially compared to uh, if you were to be fuzzing an application and every time you, you know, click and you boot up the application each time. So if you're fuzzing, uh, for example, Word, and every time you you change a fuzz input, you actually like click on the the file or you automatically like have it open up the file. You're talking about uh, like three to five seconds of overhead opening Word, and then about you know, 200 milliseconds to parse the file. So you're going to get like maybe 20 fuzz cases per minute per core. Uh, whereas with Fulkervisor, I get about 2,500 fuzz cases per second uh, among 64 cores. I don't know whatever that comes out to. Um, about 40, 40 inputs per second. So imagine making a fuzzer in Windows that could somehow f open up Word 40 times a second on every core without any um, contention. So um, this differential restore is the fundamental thing that you need to implement immediately once you have your fuzzer working. So first, write it without the differential restore. Blindly restore all the memory. But the first thing you should do when you're making a hypervisor for fuzzing like this is add differential restoring. I've made a QMU uh, fuzzer before that can run like ARM or MIPS or whatever that has some of the same like Vulcarvisor principles, and I got the same like 10 to 100 to 1,000 times speed up for whatever you're fuzzing because you're restoring so little state. You're restoring register state and then only the memory that's been touched, and it's awesome. So much fun. Um, and then at this point in time, start a new fuzz case. So this is kind of the core loop. Um, and that's going to start, uh, let's go uh, here. Go to tef. So 
basically, old boot requests all the snapshot images that will only happen once. Uh, your fuzzer will have to change the VM in whatever way. There's plenty of ways. You can change the register state. You can change the memory. Whatever you want, you can map in new memory. Whatever you need to do to make your fuzzer get its input in and get its entropy into that VM, because that VM is going to be deterministic when running under the VM. Uh, VMs run. It ends execution due to timeout, IO access, or a fault. Uh, then it will do a differential restore and only restore the pages that have been marked as dirty, which have been written to. And then at that point, you just restart and go again. And that's basically the very, very, very basic uh, level of no code coverage, no memory coverage, none of these different things. So that is how the core uh, execution works. So any questions on that? I'm going to uh, quickly top off my water here because I'm getting a little bit sick and I hope uh, this doesn't interfere. So, so any questions so far? This is just kind of the basic uh, standard execution and hypervisor environment uh, without all the bells and whistles and code coverage, which is what we're going to go into next. Any, any mockery or complaints, tell me if my uh, mic is too loud or too fuzzy or bit rate's too low or the font's bad or anything like that. Uh, so someone asked, have I, have I benchmarked full provisor compared to QMU? Um, I kind of have, but not directly. I've never fuzzed the same target in QMU as I have on Volkervisor. So I don't really have a good comparison there. I know a lot of the uh, differences translate, so a lot of the when, uh, the way I do code coverage and all those different things uh, kind of translate and they're very similar on both platforms, but no, I haven't run the exact same target. Uh, that'd be fun to kind of do. Um, so someone asks, uh, is the point of doing this at hypervisor level to find kernel vulnerabilities? Um, so that is one benefit, is that I can use this to find kernel vulns, and it's uh, one of the only fuzzers out there that can kind of lift the whole kernel and go really quickly. I know other people have similar things, and I'm not saying it's one of the only as if it's good. It's, you know, I think a lot of people have the programming capacity to write this, and that's why I'm trying to do these videos. Um, I want other people to write things similar to this that are much better written than my AMD64 thing. But uh, the reason I bring the kernel with it is because it gets me those things like system calls and it gets me uh, file caching. So um, I don't know if you were here for the very start of the video, but I initially started out as having this being an application level hypervisor where I'd only lift an application. And the problem with that is there are a lot of syscalls that I didn't actually have the correct uh, support for such that say, say the syscall is just saying, hey, uh, what version of Windows am I running under? Now that's a very underwhelming syscall, and it's not going to hit any I.O., it's just going to basically fill a structure and immediately return to user land, but I would have to go and implement that. Whereas if I snapshot at the kernel level, I get that syscall for free. I don't have to implement it, I don't have to implement any I.O. under it, um, I just kind of take it for granted. Uh, so that's why I take the whole kernel with. Uh, initially, yes, I did start out as a user mode uh, fuzzer, and I made a video on that. Um, and basically, I, it came down to one of two things. Either A, I would have to rigorously implement all the different syscalls for all the different uh, platforms I'd be running, Linux, uh, Windows, all these different things, or I could start transitioning into being a kernel-level hypervisor and bring the whole kernel with. And that was the decision I ended up making, simply uh, for time constraints, and I wouldn't have to base emulation off of uh, reverse out syscalls. Um, so another thing I want to uh, say up here is for faults, which is uh, uh, something else that I have to take into consideration that's kind of an intricacy of faults. Uh, so a fault uh, for like a memory violation is going to show up as a few different things. So you're going to get uh, UD, which is an undefined opcode, um, and that's going to happen if PC gets set to something that is executable, 
but is not a valid instruction. You're going to get a PF, which is page faults. Um, or you're going to get a GP, which is a general purpose. Now, if, you've done, if you've done any OS level stuff, you'll know that you get a GP fault on many different things. However, on 64-bit systems, you get a GP on, on non-canon memory accesses. And basically what this is saying is you can only have 52 or 48, I always forget the amount of bits that you can have in an address. Uh, and addresses, virtual addresses, must be sign extended, such that there are a lot of addresses that you can't represent. For example, this address is non-canon. So if you were to do a, um, let's do a move racks OX 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then a move RDX racks, you're not actually going to get a, a page fault here, you're going to get a general purpose fault. So basically anytime I get a general purpose fault, I'm going to be really excited because it means it's trying to uh, read or write memory that is not even canon. And very likely what you're going to get here is ASCII or something like that. Um, so this makes me uh, very happy when I get GP faults. And GP faults are usually very highly prioritized in my output. Um, now, a problem you're going to have with page faults is that page faults occur a lot under normal conditions. And basically, uh, for example, on Windows, when you allocate a bunch of memory um, and you just have it zeroed out, Windows is not actually going to allocate 4K of physical memory and zero it out and then return it to you. All it's going to do is go into the page tables and mark that there should be a zero page here such that when someone tries to access that memory, it will get a page fault, then it will handle it by allocating zero out, zeroing out that memory and letting the actual um, uh, exception go through. And a problem with this at the hypervisor level is now I need to be able to determine for each OS that I'm running under here what is an, a true page fault, like a second chance page fault, and what is a page fault where it's maybe it's reading page.memory from disk or it's reading uh, a null page that has been allocated but actually hasn't been uh, loaded into physical memory. So I need to be able to determine that. So uh, what I actually did was a little bit of re uh, reversing to find NT page fault, I think, is the page fault handler. Um, and then at some point in time, uh, it goes down a path uh, for only true page faults. So basically, I found out that eventually it goes through a bunch of compares, calls a, different, a bunch of different functions. I can't remember what they were. It was kind of like a one-day thing where I went through this. And there's one path where if it goes down that path, it's a real exception. If it goes down the other path, it's going to be handled, and then the exception is going to be uh, passed through, and everything is going to resume, and it's all going to be handy dandy. Um, so that was one problem. I actually haven't added support for this on Linux, so I can't really capture page faults on Linux. But then again, I haven't really had anything to fuzz on Linux, so I haven't set this up. Uh, for Linux, I'd probably actually um, make a little bit of a modified guest where I'd build a custom kernel uh, such that I'd be able to make these modifications a little simpler. Um, uh, have I loaded any other operating systems but Windows and Falk Advisor? Um, I have loaded Linux once at the very start, and that would have been like a, whatever the latest Debian was in the fall of last year. I remember uh, I was I like connected in on IRC through that. Um, and uh, what versions of Windows? I have done Windows uh, 7, Windows 8.1. I don't think I've ever actually done 8. And I've done Windows 10, all 64-bit. I've never done a 32-bit VM under Falkervisor. So 32 and 64-bit VM should work absolutely fine, regardless of, uh, of what OS they are uh, in terms of the snapshot mode, because it will just have direct pass-through uh, of the hardware. Um, but then when it comes to fuzz mode, uh, the snapshotting will still work and all that, um, but when I get to fuzz mode, I'm not going to be able to support the things like the page faults. Um, but the actual execution, differential restore, ending on timeouts, i-axes, and faults that are not page faults, that will still work just fine. 
Uh, another question was, um, do I do anything to avoid context switches? Um, I do not do anything at the hypervisor level, but I do at the snapshot level, uh, not when, not automatically, it's just as, as like, uh, a researcher when I'm using Cultivisor, um, I simply keep in mind, hey, this cannot handle I.O., it can't handle disk, it can't handle display, it can't handle thread switches or context switches. So I have that in my mind and I say, okay, if this is going to do a thread switch, I'm not going to do a snapshot now, I'm going to do a snapshot later after it does the task switch and it starts processing data. So I'm going to I'm going to take the snapshot right before it starts doing processing of data. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of how that is set up. So uh, those are kind of the intricacies of the page faults and GP faults. Um, so to actually resolve a GP fault, so if you're going through with Windybug or GDB and you're actually faulting on this instruction where it's trying to read forum, 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 and it's going to tell you that that's what it's trying to read, you need a disassembler to do that. I do not have a disassembler integrated in Falk Advisor, such that um, when I get a GP fault, I don't actually know what value is in there. As a human, after the fact, I can look through and determine that. Um, but without a disassembler, I do not have a way of knowing that this is accessing foreign, foreign, foreign. I just know it GP faulted on this. Um, that's something I'd maybe add in the future, but it's really not too critical, not something I need. So, uh, so that kind of covers uh, the page fault, GP fault stuff, which is important to know. Um, any other questions before I move on to code coverage or complaints or font sizes or Someone just joined chat um, and they were asking what uh, uh, what Falk Advisor is. So uh, I'll just quickly go through it, try and do it in less than a minute or two. Uh, Falk Advisor is a hypervisor that is for uh, running a um, guest OS in it and then it is uh, used for very quickly fuzzing targets in the guest, whether it be a kernel or a user land application running under Falk Advisor um, and it incorporates some uh, good fuzzing techniques such as code coverage, memory coverage, uh, differential snapshots and restore for quicker uh, restores. So it's mainly geared towards very quick fuzzing, heavily instrumented, done at the kernel level so you can fuzz kernel level things. Um, and that's kind of the gist of it. I eventually, after doing a few of these, I, I would eventually love to do like a talk at like a Black Hat or a DEF CON. So uh, I'm sorry this is a little bit crude. I'm not too familiar with what to say, so eventually I'll come up with a good one minute, five minute, and ten minute introductions of Falk Advisor that are a little bit more, a little bit more well rehearsed and 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 thought through. So, uh, so uh, someone said I could put in like Capstone or Zed. Uh, that's something I've thought of. Um, uh, I was trying to trying to think about whether or not I wanted to write my own uh, my own disassembler, which. If you've noticed, or if you know me at all, uh, I like writing everything from scratch. Uh, this is mainly, I just enjoy learning, I enjoy just doing it. It's not, I don't have anything against other implementations. I don't, I don't think my code's much better. If anything, my code's probably much worse. Um, I just enjoy doing it. But uh, disassemblers are a little bit overwhelming that I don't know if it'd be worthwhile. Although for the GP stuff, uh, I don't actually need a full disassembler. I just need a disassembler that's able to pu pull out the mod RM byte such that I'm able to see which, uh, what memory is actually being addressed, um, so, uh, or accessed. So. All right, so now let's go on to code coverage. And so, Falk Advisor uses uh, interrupt slash timer based code coverage. So. And what is interrupt or timer-based code coverage? Um, this is very interesting. So a lot of people might be uh, familiar with AFL, and I am only slightly familiar with AFL, so if I say anything incorrect here, please let me know. Um, but to my understanding, AFL does its code coverage by building applications with a custom version of a compiler that has these AFL modifications in it to add um, 
a little bit of uh, code coverage information on each branch that is emit from the compiler. I think that's how it's done. That's a very broad statement of how it's done. It's probably got a bunch more intricacies than that. Um, but the uh, thing that something like AFL will have or QMU will have is it will have true co code coverage, what I would consider true code coverage, uh, where it will be able to tell you the entire path that uh, program execution took. I go through an interrupt or timer-based code coverage, which is basically at a very high rate. We're talking millions or billions of times per second. I have a timer interrupt come through, interrupt the VM, which causes a VM exit, and then in this state that I've got this interrupt, I simply record the LBR information. Um, so I'll go into LBR a little bit in a second here. Um, actually, I probably should just go into it now. So LBR is a um, uh, Intel and AMD uh, feature that uh, basically uh, records last branches taken. Hence, last branch recording, which is what LBR stands for. Um, so uh, LBR on Intel stores the last eight branches, I think, taken, and LBR on AMD only stores the last branch taken. So on Intel, you definitely have an advantage there over AMD. So what you'll see on AMD systems is you'll see, um, you'll have two different MSRs. Uh, branch from and branch to. So if you were to go down a code branch of a thousand that ended up branching to two thousand, um, what you'll get is branch from will have a thousand in it and branch two will have two thousand in it. And that is all the information you get out of AMD. Um, what's really cool is this is, is very, very quick, uh, enabling LBR is really no performance ha overhead on neither Intel or AMD. Um, so how many branches execute between interrupts? So I can't actually control how many branches execute between the interrupts. Um, it's all timer, like wall clock based. Um, but I use IBS, which I'll go into in a bit, and IBS adds uh, random noise into those timers. So it actually isn't the same amount of time each time. It's a little bit random. Uh, each time. Um, so, uh, but approximately how many branches execute between interrupts? I can't tell you how many branches, but I can say on a complex target like Word, I usually only get about four to ten interrupts per fuzz case. So in the entire time of processing an RTF, I get maybe four to ten um, interrupts, which is a very small amount very small amount. Luckily, with thousands of fuzz cases and a bunch of cores doing all these different things, uh, it actually converges very quickly where uh, uh, it samples all the different, um, all the different branches that have been taken. Um, and what is the usable variance miss in missed branches? Uh, that is not really something that I can compute. The problem with that is, um, I can't turn on single stepping. Like if I single step through, if I do single branch stepping, then I would be able to, which is a mode I support, um, then I'm able to see true uh, code coverage. Um, but if I turn that on and do the interrupt sampling, now I'm running about 40 times slower because of the single stepping, which then increases the number of, of uh, interrupts. But you could probably safely say each uh, I think a standard like unmodified RTF input that's about 200 kilobytes in size hits I think about 20,000 basic blocks of coverage. And it takes about 10, 10 to 15 seconds of running through that original input file to converge to the point that you really don't see an increase in code coverage. Sure you might have missed a few blocks here and there, um, but roughly you have already sampled uh, most of the blocks that you actually care about. So yes, I will definitely miss some blocks. Um, but once again, it's true. 
but it's very fast. The overhead of doing this in our base code coverage is about a 5% slowdown, as opposed to um, branch-based uh, single stepping, which is about a 20 time slowdown, and full-blown single stepping is about a 40 to 60 time slowdown. Once again, depends on the application, the architecture, all these different things, but that's kind of the, the rough, rough numbers that you get. Um, so I use IBS. Now, IBS is called uh, instruction-based sampling. Uh, now, IBS is AMD only, and this is one of the reasons that I am using an AMD system. So IBS, uh, uh, the gist of it is you give it a uh, uh, number of ticks, uh, then it's, it counts down these ticks and then fires an interrupt after this counter hits zero. That's, that's the gist of what IBS does. Um, now there's one feature that I leverage out of IBS is the bottom three or four bits, I can't remember how many bits it is, but the bottom three or four bits you can't actually set, um, can't actually set. And uh, what you can do is you can tell the processor in IBS mode to randomize these bottom three or four bits. Um, what's really neat with that is you get processor uh, randomization for free such that it will change your uh, sampling by, uh, you know, zero to 16 cycles. Uh, and what's great about that is over time that basically completely randomizes your timer intervals, which means you're going to sample relevant information. Now, uh, even if you didn't have the random, you'd get enough randomness from caching and latency and fetching from different cores and all these different things that change processor performance. Um, but it is nice to have that directly random. Uh, okay. So someone ask, is asking, what am I doing? So I'm going through a hypervisor that I've written. It is a very lightweight hypervisor that uh, can run and snapshot an OS under it. Uh, for the purpose of uh, debugging and fuzzing and finding uh, security vulnerabilities in the software. Um, so I'm kind of going through the concepts of, of what I've done, what I want to do, uh, things that I've done that have sucked, and things that I've done that have been great and everyone should do, uh, and all these different things. Um, do I use higher revolution coverage at any point, like initial input processing? I do not, but it's something that I thought of. So all of this uh, timer-based stuff is all configurable and some defines. I can't do it at runtime. Obviously, I could add that where it would support changes at runtime, but currently I do not. I just manually have to rebuild another Fulkervisor, pixie boot it, and it will change the um, frequency of which it samples. Um, I'm kind of right on the edge of uh, if I were to make it sample any more, it would start to really degrade performance, so I'd get like a two or a three time slowdown. So I'm kind of on the happy medium. Um, one thing that I do want to experiment with uh, is having uh, maybe 60 of the 64 cores doing full-blown uh, uh, execution with this interrupt-based uh, sampling, and then have four of the 64 cores, the remaining four cores, do very deep dives where they're doing uh, branch stepping or single stepping to get a little bit more information out of that. I still use single stepping and branch stepping when I'm debugging manually, um, but I don't actually integrate it with the fuzzing process in any automated way, which is something I want to do. So I'm going to make a note of that. Uh, how can we use single stepping slash true code coverage to benefit? Um, because that is definitely something. So, IBS also has some other things that it gives us for free that are great. Uh, if the, um, so IBS is used mainly for performance uh, monitoring. Uh, it gives information on stalls, cache, hits and misses, branch, uh, missed predictions, etc. So it gets you a lot of different information that it populates in MSRs. Now one thing that's really nice about um, IBS is that it is um, uh, it is supported under a VM. So there are a lot of new technologies that are coming around that are not supported under VMs yet. 
Uh, this is a little bit old enough that, and simple enough that it's actually supported under the VMs. So the thing that I use IBS for is IBS for free uh, tells you the physical and uh, virtual addresses for RIP. Um, so what's really nice about that is uh, I don't actually use the physical address, but I initially was going to. Um, so I, I use LBR only for my code coverage, um, but I use IBS as my sampling. So IBS randomly interrupts, and then once uh, during the IBS interrupt, uh, I actually pull out the LBR branch from and branch to. Um, but what's nice is IBS, uh, I kind of initially use the physical memory in IBS uh, because it gives you the physical address for RIP for free. Now what's really nice about that is I don't have to take the virtual address and translate it. And the reason you would use a physical address opposed to a virtual address is that the physical addresses will are uh, you can think of it as a very primitive hash of CR3 uh, and the virtual address. Whereas basically, if you're accessing the same virtual address but in a different context, uh, it will show up as a different memory access. Uh, that's kind of like a poor man's way of getting um, the virtual address and the um, uh, CR3, uh, the task, kind of mixed together. Um, but the other thing that IBS gives you also tells you whether the instruction was a load or a store, or neither, uh, as well as the uh, physical and virtual address of the load or store if it was one. So this is what's really cool, is that Every single time I get my interrupts to come through, I am able to see whether or not it was a loader or store operation. And then furthermore, it will tell me if it was a loader or store operation, what memory, physical and virtual, was being accessed. So I get all these decodes for free, and basically I don't even need an assembler, it just immediately tells me process, process, processor accelerated, um, whether it was a loader or store. Um, and this is really cool because this allows me to log uh, which basic blocks and which uh, instructions are reading and writing what memory. And that's something we're going to go into a little bit more deeply later. Uh, and we're going to call this uh, memory coverage. And we're going to call this uh, relative and absolute. And we'll go into that a little bit. A lot of that is theoretical and not uh, entirely implemented yet. Um, but I have no reason to believe that it won't be doable and it won't work. Um, just going to quickly read through chat. So, any questions so far? That's kind of the very basic gist of how I do the code coverage, and then I'm going to go into storage of the code coverage in a uh, uh, right after this. Um, but let me get another drink of water. So feel free to ask questions now, and then I'll move on to the storage of the code coverage. Uh, how's everyone enjoying their, their Mondays? Sorry for the drinking noises. Anyways, doesn't seem like there are any questions. So I'm going to move on to the storage of the code coverage. So, uh, initial bulk advisor used uh, bswap of branch 2 xor ah, br from. So this was a, a really uh, Someone ask uh, or answer someone's question on context switches. Uh, yes, uh, I don't actually do anything automatically to avoid context switches. Um, it's something I do as a human while I'm taking a snapshot to think in the cons think in consideration: uh, is there going to be a context switch in the future? If there is, should I snapshot after that? So it's not something that's done automatically. It's something that I do kind of in the 
in my head when I'm actually thinking about where I want to take a snapshot, which I would say is one of the most important things of this entire architecture, is deciding where you want to snapshot, where you want to start mutation and execution. Because usually it is not when you click a file in Explorer, it's not when you drop a file in a browser, it's when it actually starts processing that. And that's something really important that uh, you can use at any state, whether it's an AFL, whether you have a debugger-based uh, fuzzer, any, any of these different things. So, so initially Filtervisor made this really crappy hash from the uh, Indian slot branch two with branch from. And the reason I did this Indian slot was to kind of leverage the fact that you're going to have the canonical addresses. Um, and from that, you're going to have the Fs or the zeros at the start. So let's say uh, the address for branch two is this, and the address for branch from is uh, 2335. So what I'm actually going to get after my little crappy hash is I'm going to get, um, uh, if I do my Indian swap correctly, 3132335. So this is now going to be my code coverage hash. And then I would then go to store this 64-bit uh, hash uh, in a table. And if it is present in that table, I will save the uh, input file in there. If it's or if it's not present in the table, I will add this element to the table and then copy the input file to this table. However, if it is already present, I'm just simply going to say, hey, it's already there, and I'm going to continue on. Uh, this is also the point that I uh, increment some counters of like how many unique basic blocks have I hit, uh, etc. Um, so now, uh, later, Qualitrevisor uses fault hash to properly hash BR, uh, basically a tuple of BR2 and BR from. And in the future, I might add arbitrary information to this, um, but I'm currently using full cache. And uh, full cache is a 128 bits uh, AES uh, based caching algorithm, uh, which is super duper fast. And you can find this source at https colon slash slash github.com gnozo labs slash full cache, I think. Let me, let me see if that one works. Yes, that link does work. So that is already open source. Um, it should only work on Intel and AMD systems as it relies on AES acceleration, but it's very fast and it's 128 bit hash and it passes all the SM hasher tests. Okay, is this a bitmap or hit counts? Um, it is neither. Um, basically, it is a uh, very similar to like a page table layout, where I divide up this hash, this 128-bit hash, into different pieces. Uh, yes, this is being recorded, and it will be put on YouTube. Um, so I take the 128-bit hash, and I uh, group it into different bins, and then I basically do something very similar to a binary tree. Um, there's probably actually a name for whatever I'm doing, but it's a binary tree with a little bit more than two entries at each, each um, row. And the only reason I do more than two entries is it just happened to be a little bit more efficient. So uh, what's convenient is that this table is fully atomic. So what I do is I um, uh, I go through to um, I go through to add whatever element to this table, and it will either return that uh, there was already an element and a pointer to the element that's already stored there, or it will return, hey, there is no element, and it will return a pointer to the location that I have to fill in with an element. Uh, so it's up to me at that point, if it's not filled in, to fill it in. Uh, it's kind of a weird API. Uh, I have an implementation of it for, um, uh, for both uh, Windows, Linux, and uh, Fulcrovisor, and C, and uh, Assembly. Uh, I could kind of go through that at a later point in this video, if that works out. Um, but it's basically where the hash is stored in the positioning of the table itself, not actually in the elements. And then the elements themselves are simply pointers. So what that does is it points to a structure which contains information like uh, how many times have we seen this basic block, um, how, many, um, how big is the input file, 
a pointer to the input file or just the actual input file. Um, I can put really whatever I want in there. So every time I hit a basic block, I can potentially update uh, the previous storage for that basic block with, hey, we have new information. Hey, we hit new memory in this basic block. All these different things. So it's very uh, open-ended. It is, it is not a bit tree. It is not just a counter. It's uh, arbitrary structures of, of whatever you want. Um, so that's how the storage of the code coverage is done. Uh, so I could go a little bit more into the details of that uh, a little bit later in the video. I kind of want to get through the core stuff first because um, I want to make this video as dense as possible. Um, okay, so now let's go into the use of code coverage. So this is where things get really fun. How do I actually use this code coverage information? So uh, as I was saying before, um, uh, each block, each basic block, has a um, counter associated with the frequency uh, with the number of times we've seen it. Once again, since we are interrupt based and timer based, uh, this number is not actually going to be 100% accurate, but it will be relatively accurate um, and it's good enough. So that's the principle I go by, the good enough principle. Um, so at this point in time, we have uh, a big database of all the different memory that we're accessing, and it's 128-bit uh, with a very collision-resistant uh, hash, such that we shouldn't have the problems that AFL has, where you're going to have like the I think it uses 16-bit identifiers, which is great because it's uh, fast for a bitmap. Uh, but its downsides are that uh, for any normal-sized application, you're going to have collisions almost immediately after 20,000 some blocks, which is like just opening an RTF and not even mutating it. Uh, so um, obviously they'll probably eventually change that to be a larger size, um, but that's really nothing to fault them for. It's just a, a different change that, that I have. Um, so each basic block has a counter associated with it. So in Fulcrovisor, uh, in early Fulcrovisor, I kept a sorted table of basic blocks based on uh, frequency. So uh, this was really simple. I just kept a whole other data structure that pointed to the memory in the table. Uh, and I every like five seconds or so, it was purely timer-based. I'm uh, scrolling down. Sorry about that. Um, purely timer-based, um, I would uh, uh, just completely uh, resort the database. So I did it like every five seconds or so. So every five seconds, I would sort this database so I would then know what are the most common blocks, what are the least common blocks. Um, and then what I would do is I would pick the least common and the elements, once again tunable. I usually had it as like 64 or 128. So I'd pick the randomly out of the least common 64 basic blocks, I would pick one of those inputs. And then instead of restoring the original input file, I would use that as the base input file and mutate on top of that. Um, so, uh, uh, so this would uh, pick uh, one of the least common 64 inputs and use it as the base for the uh, next generation of mutation. So basically, take one of the least common blocks, uh, inputs, use it as the base for the next generation of mutation, mutate on top of it, run it through again, same old, same old, same old. Um, so it's a lot of fun, uh, but I ran into some problems with this, which is uh, kind of very interesting. And it, I don't know exactly what the very specific problem is. Um, However, I can take a guess. So my problem was eventually I would hit code coverage stalls, where I would no longer really be advancing my code coverage at all. Uh, normally I follow a very logarithmic pattern, such that um, over time it becomes exponentially harder to find a new basic block, which is expected. But I was getting basically uh, log log or log squared, I don't know if those are the same thing. Um, Basically, it would taper off more than log scale, which is a problem. So I was trying to figure out why my uh, code coverage was stalling. 
And I never figured out exactly why, but my guess is that since I'm doing interrupt-based sampling, eventually I would sample a block that is so hard to sample. Like, maybe it's a, a block that's two instructions wide, and I would just happen to sample that. And basically, over time, I would pollute the code coverage database with these blocks that are so hard to ever hit again that I would be stuck in this loop where it's like, I'm trying to rediscover these, these blocks over and over again, and I'm just failing to. Um, so, in later Polkervisor, Polkervisor, uh, counter um, uh, sorted, actually the sorted database was ditched. So this was nice because it got rid of some of the complexity. Now I only had one database rather than two databases, so it was a little bit easier to uh, follow the code and a little bit simpler. The question is, how would I do my uh, code coverage bias again? So the way I changed this is now, um, when I start a new fuzz case and I'm trying to determine what the base of the input file is, I randomly select n inputs from the code coverage database. This is with no bias whatsoever. And usually n is like, ah, oops, n is uh, usually like yeah, 16 or so. Then out of the 16, of the 16 inputs, pick the least common one. So basically, instead of picking truly the least common entries in the code coverage database, I would randomly pick 16 things with no bias out of the code coverage database, and then I'd use the least common of those 16 as the uh, input file. And what this did is it basically gets rid of the stalls, because it is very unlikely once you have 200,000, 300,000 basic blocks of coverage, it's very unlikely that one of the 16 you pick is going to be that really rare stalling, you're never going to hit it again basic block. However, with enough time, you will, you know, at, at 3,000, 4,000 fuzzes per second, after an hour or so, you are likely going to hit the branches that you do care about, the inputs that do hit unique branches that you really want to try again. Um, so this is actually what the current model does. It decreased complexity. It slowed things down a bit because selecting 16 elements costs a lot more than selecting one. Um, but it was a price that uh, uh, it's really not noticeable when it comes to execution time. And uh, at this level, I really don't care about anything less than a 20% slowdown. So if there's a 10% slowdown or 15% slowdown, I really don't care because it's not very noticeable when it comes to output of bugs, crashes, uh, stuff like that. Um, so that is how the code coverage is used. Uh, and basically, I uh, use this input as the base of the next buzz case. Cool. So that is the basics of the code coverage. Um, I guess the biggest mistake I made was the uh, stalling before with having the sorted input database. I used that method for probably about three months. Um, then again, I usually don't fuzz for more than uh, 20 to 40 hours. So usually I run the server for 20 to 40 hours and after that I usually turn it off because it's plateaued, it's not finding any new bugs. Um, theoretically it would maybe find another bug but usually your code coverage and your bug counts are almost always going to be logarithmic. So if you find 10 bugs in your first hour, and then one bug in your next hour, and then it takes another 10 hours to find another bug, eh, eventually it would take a week to find your next bug. And do you really need that next bug that bad? Eh, maybe. Depends. You know, that's that's totally up to you. Or maybe you want to scale up and, and use something else. Um, cool. So that is the code coverage aspects. And I'll put this file up online. Uh, I guess it's like I'm kind of building slides as I go. So I'll, I'll put these up uh, somewhere else, even though they don't work too well out of context. Um, so let's do the next thing. Uh, we're going to call the next thing called crash coverage. Crash coverage is kind of similar to code coverage, such that I store each unique crash that I get. And this is what's difficult. What is a unique crash? Uh, is that a different PC? Is that a different faulting address? Is that a different type of crash? 
Uh, is it a different registry context, uh, stack state, function you're in, uh, call stack, all these different things. Um, so since I'm doing interrupt-based sampling, I need to be able to very quickly uh, kind of determine what state of this, what state the system is in, or even at this level when I'm looking at a crash, I need to be relatively quick. So I think I probably could walk the stack and go by uniqueness from that, and that's something I want to add in the future, so let's uh, make a note of that. Uh, but I haven't gotten to that yet. So uh, initially, Polkervisor used unique PC. That's it. That's all it used. Whatever, the, if, if I had a new rip, that was a new crash, and that's it. That, that was it, the entirety of it. Uh, then later, Polkervisor used uh, unique uh, PC EI2. Uh, oops. Um, so EI2 is exit info 2, which is where the faulting address is stored in the uh, AMD SVN implementation. Um, but it's just whatever you would get in, uh, what is it, CR2? I think CR2 uh, on a page file. So same information. So I started using a tuple of PC and the faulting address such that, okay, if you crash at a PC with two different addresses, you would, I would report it, um, each one. So the problem with this is uh, I would get like, about two or three terabytes a day of crashing inputs stored off on my server. And they were basically all the same crashes, but they had different faulting addresses due to different stack and heap and all these different states, which caused so many problems, and it was just so much crap to sort through. So I needed to come up with another method of classifying crashes in a way that I'd be comfortable reporting um, a few of each type. So then I created Polkervisor used uh, up to 10 unique PC faulting address. So it was the next, the next step. All I did was I said um, uh, up to 10 unique PCs, or actually, how do I want to say this? Up to 10 unique faulting addresses for each PC. Basically, I could crash 10 times on the same PC with 10 different memory accesses and I would report all 10 crashes. After that, if I get another crash on that PC, I'm never going to report it again. Um, which definitely dropped my usage down from the couple terabytes a day to not even a gig a day. Like a huge decrease that it was, that it was parsable. But this had another problem. Uh, and this is uh, say you had a bug that showed up as uh, bug shows up as null DRF, uh, and I consider on null DRF like 0 to 16 kilobytes in memory. Um, uh, but then later in, later in time shows up as a non null DRF. So if it showed up as a crash word access like 0, 10, 20, all these different things, I would use up all of my reports for this crash, and then eventually, what if I got 4 and 4 and 4 and 4 and or whatever in, uh, and I would never report that because I've already used up my 10 reports for this PC. So I had to ditch that one as well. So I came up with another concept where I very quickly try to classify the bug in a few different categories, and I came up this is the current model, and it will probably change shortly. As you can see, this changes all the freaking time. Um, but the current model is classify the bug as one of four types of crashes. I think it's four. Uh, so one is uh, uh, page, uh, let's call it a null DRF. And this is when it is a page faults violation, and it, the access memory is between 0 and 16 kilobytes. And then I have a negative DRF. 
And this is when we have a page fault of between negative 16 kilobytes and zero. Uh, these are a little bit more interesting uh, than null deref's, uh, but they're usually very related. It's it, you have you have zero and it's subtracting 10 off and it's derepping that. Usually pretty useless bugs, but it's good to keep them as a different class. Then I have uh, actually it's five types. Uh, then we have a normal deref. This is a page fault of any other address. So this is not null, not negative. It's uh, a deref, and we're just going to assume it's probably free to heap or something like that, or completely invalid memory, out of bounds, who, who knows. Then we have a ASCII deref. Now keep in mind, this isn't actually an ASCII deref. I just call it that. And this is any general purpose fault. So more specifically, this is uh, non-canon memory access. I just call it an ASCII deref because it's fun, and a lot of times they are actually ASCII deref, so I get really excited. And the fifth class of bugs is uh, none of the above. And this is basically not GP or PF. So basically, it's not a general purpose fault, and it's not a page fault. Maybe it's a div by zero, maybe it's an undefined instruction, maybe it's an unaligned SSC operation, maybe it's trying to, you know, who knows? It, it's another fault that's not a general purpose or a page fault. So I basically now classify the bug into one of those five categories, which is very cheap. It's like a few branches in a switch table. It's practically free, so I can do it very cheaply. Then what I do now is for each one of these, so for each one of these five groups, then I store one of ten, then I store ten crashes per. So I can store ten null DRFs, ten negative DRFs, ten normal DRFs for each PC. So this means if I fill up all the null DRFs, and then I get a negative DRF, or I get an ASCII DRF, or, or all these different things, I will record those and still report them to the server. So the absolute worst case, uh, once again all these numbers are tunable, but the worst case is that I would report 50 crashes for each PC, uh, which is very reasonable. Um, obviously, once you get things that are crashing at PCs that are completely random PCs, and you get you're getting ASCII in PC, now you're starting to clutter things up, and I need to eventually limit that. But yeah, it's not too bad so far. So this is the current way. Um, current fault advisor. This is how we currently classify the bugs. Uh, this might change. Um, uh, stores 10 of each of the five groups of crashes. So there are better ways of class classifying bugs. I, I know people have, have better ways. This is just simple, cheap, and easy to understand uh, how I'm classifying these bugs. Um, OK, so then what I do is uh, similar to code coverage, um, randomly pick a crashing input to mutate with. Uh, so once, that's pretty much exactly as I, as I said. So uh, as code coverage, I'd randomly pick uh, entries out of the code coverage database to use as the basis of fuzzing. I do the same thing with my crash coverage. Well, I'll randomly pick a crashing input, and I will uh, use that as the basis for fuzzing. So say, for example, I have a crashing input, and then now I'm going to mutate on top of it, and that mutation changes the heap state. Like, it puts something in front of the actual crashing bytes, and that makes it crash in a different state. Maybe a null DREF has now turned into a normal DREF or an ASCII DREF, uh, which is really important uh, to, to try and do. So. Um, and uh, so I'm going to make another category uh, picking how to mutate. Uh, I'm not really going to go into the specifics of how I do mutation uh, or how to pick um, inputs base. So I'm not really go going to go into mutation or fuzzing because that depends so much on your target. Are you mutating a binary file? Uh, are you mutating TCP traffic, UDP traffic, a web page? Uh, is it a text file? All these different things. So it's I'm not really going to go into the specifics of mutation, but I will say the different input bases. 
Uh, so I have original input file, corpus of input files, thousands if not millions of input files. So uh, I have kind of the original base input file that I used when I took the snapshot. Then I have the corpus of input files, which is thousands of files that I can use as inputs that I mutate on top of. Um, once again, when I say input base, I mean the original thing that the mutator will then mutate on top of. Once again, I'm doing all mutational stuff. I'm not doing any generative fuzzing here at all. Everything's mutation. Um, then we have the code coverage inputs, and we have the crash coverage inputs. So those are the four different sources I have for inputs. And how do I pick which one? Weights. I randomly weight these differently. So I'll usually, about 5% of my cases, I'll use the original input file. 5% of the cases, I'll use a, a random input file from the corpus. Uh, probably about like 80% of the time, I'm going to use a code coverage input. And about 10% of the time, I'm going to use a crash coverage input. And I just randomly pick. When I'm starting a new fuzz case, I'm going to say, hey, what is the base image? And I just kind of pick one of the four categories, and then I pick inside those four categories. Um, is this some old school X word fix with fonts? Uh, yes. Well, no, given I'm on Windows, but it's it's terminal in, I think, 18 point font. So doesn't scale very well. Sorry about that, but deal with it. So that's how I pick the input base. Um, I'm going to go through how do I usually mutate. So this is about as deep as I'm going to go into mutation, which is how do I usually do mutation, uh, say I'm doing a file-based mutator. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my corpus of inputs, randomly pick data from the corpus, and inject it randomly in the base input file. That's it. And it looks like my internet may have cut out. Nope, looks like I'm back. Sorry. I'm going to wait till I see that come through. OK, cool. Um, so this is uh, the basics of how I usually fuzz. Uh, I sometimes do generate generative fuzzing, but usually it's just uh, I'll randomly pick some data from the corpus and randomly throw it throughout the input file. So that doesn't work too well on binary data, but it works somewhat well when you have code coverage. So the cool thing about code coverage is things that usually don't work sometimes start working. So if you start flipping bits or you start uh, just changing random bytes, uh, similar to flipping bits, in normal fuzzing, usually that's worthless because your input isn't going to do anything. But with code coverage, you kind of gain a little bit out of it because if you hit a unique branch, you'll then amplify and build on that later. So you can kind of do bit flipping on binary protocols, but uh, binary protocols you usually want like generative or something like that. And I'm not going to go too through into the generative or any of that as, once again, that's kind of out of the out of the scope of this video and and really when it comes to writing fuzzers you just need to use your imagination so this is all based on the harness and instrumentation okay uh, yeah I'm just splicing inputs that's about it that's it uh, usually is good enough uh, code coverage takes care of of branches uh, so other things we can go into uh, uh, branch solving We'll go into that as well. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything that I miss. So the snapshotting, very simple. Execution, differential restore, that's huge. Code coverage, LBR, IBS. Storage of the code coverage. Uh, use of the code coverage. Crash coverage. Uh, classifying bugs. Waiting inputs. Mutates. Splicing. I'll just put that here. Um, uh, okay, using coverage locations to help it all with splicing? I am not. Uh, all I'm doing is, uh, the, the only way that coverage affects mutation is it just changes the input file. 
So all I do is iteratively use a different input file that I mutate on top of. So the mutation that I apply, uh, like I don't actually log any information about the mutation. Uh, do I do any form of bug triage other than deduping? Yes, I do, and that is something I will go into in the uh, comparing results from different snapshots in a little bit. I'm trying to think about anything that I want to hit on now before I delve, in, delve into any of those other groups. Um, and I'm going to take a quick sip of water. Um, so once these results are all shipped off to another server, uh, that's where I'll actually do an uh, analysis on them. Uh, I'll ship off the uh, register state as well as the input file, and I'll be able to run that input file through on the other machine to see if it repros. If it repros, then I um, then I log uh, how it reproed, see if that repros the same it did in the VM, do all these different things. Um, possible good idea. If the two if two discrete inputs have an overlap in the percent coverage towards the end, it might be good to splice candidates. Haven't tried. Um, Let's see, if two discrete inputs have an overlap of coverage for the end, it might be good to splice candidates. Uh, okay, are you, are you saying like if two inputs have very similar coverage that it'd be good to maybe splice them together because they're touching the same code but maybe in slightly different ways? Um, if you mean that, the problem with my current architecture, since I don't have true code coverage, I can't really say two inputs have similar uh, coverage. With the exception of if I finally add the single stepping mode where maybe I'd randomly have a core pick uh, a snapshot or a code coverage input to deep dive into that and then dives down and then finds um, its true branches that it's taken and then compare that to another. So most will have similar coverage at a beginning and then diff towards the end. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I do not use that information and that is information that I'd love to be using. Um, so uh, one of the things, I can't remember who I was talking to, but I was mentioning that what would be really um, cool would be to eventually have one server doing all this fuzzing and then another server ingesting all the fuzz information, doing very complex analysis on it, comparing inputs, uh, trying to figure out what's causing crashes, minimization, all these different things, and then feeding that that complex information back to the fuzzer to say, hey, you know these inputs you keep trying? Maybe those aren't worthwhile. Or hey, this fuzz, fuzz method, maybe you should tune it more to generate this style of input. Um, how I do that really depends on the target. That's going to be like fuzz specific again. Uh, so another thing that I forgot to mention was minimization. So minimization is really great under the uh, hypervisor because it's very, very cheap. When I can do 2,000 inputs per second, I can very quickly just lob off random chunks of the file and see if I still crash. And that's all I do. Randomly change, uh, randomly delete parts slash move parts slash merge parts slash change size of input file. Um, and basically, uh, if it crashes in the same way as before, store this as the new minimal uh, input. Uh, and let's, uh, oops, sorry. Um, and this is really all the logic of the minimization. And it works really well for uh, text files, not so well for binary files. I'd want to expand on this for binary. Um, but I haven't really done much work with binary stuff under Fulcrovisor yet. So I really haven't had a reason to experiment with that. Um, but what's really cool is when you're doing 2,000 fuzz cases per second, or in this case, minimization cases, if you're working with a 200 kilobyte file and you, you know, every time you delete one byte from the file, eventually you're going to very quickly get down to what's actually causing the bug. Uh, so in like a real world scenario, when I have like a 200 kilobyte input file for, uh, say, a Word document, uh, it usually takes about 5 to 10 minutes to minimize it down to the... 50 to 100 bytes that actually causes the crash. And it's really cool to watch this because you see like this mutated, completely random blob of an input file that has really no order to it. It's all random chaos that's all spliced in. 
and then all of a sudden you get this like clean, minimized out. You can clearly see um, how it's invoking a crash. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, it's applying a number that's really big and causing it to go out of bounds, or it's using something twice and causing a use after free or a double free. Um, so, so that's a lot of fun to go through. Uh, let's see. Uh, Okay, someone just tuned in. Can I summarize what's going on? Um, so I'm going through a hypervisor that I designed uh, to, for uh, fuzzing and code coverage and basically security research and debugging. So I'm trying to find vulnerabilities in software and I'm trying to do it with a complex debugger and fuzzer that can quickly revert, snapshot, mutate, uh, change inputs, and monitor how programs behave uh, with the new mutated inputs to try and get them to crash or fall over in ways to uh, find impact bugs. So, um, so uh, let's see, minimization. So that's kind of the basics of minimization. I have some ideas on how to do binary stuff, but that's kind of tough to get into. There's not, not a great way of skinning that cat. Um, so the next thing I want to hit is branch solving, in quotes. Uh, this is a technique I, uh, I don't want to say I designed it because I definitely am probably not the first person to do it, but I implemented it without knowing, you know, any other ways of doing it. What I do is I look for compare instructions that have input file data presence in a register. It sounds really stupid, but if I see a, uh, if I see a compare of racks with RBX and RBX is foreign, 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 whatever, and this is present in the input file, I will assume completely blindly, and I know there are many problems with this assumption, I will assume that this foreign, foreign, foreign came from the input file because it's present in there, and I'll replace all occurrences in the input file where this magic form 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 is present with whatever is in racks. Uh, because racks is whatever it's expecting. So it's looking for a certain value, and I see it's getting something from the input file and comparing it against something. So I'll do a few things with that. I'll set it to equal, not equal, off by one, uh, above and below, uh, etc. So just basically, if it's doing a compare for, uh, e since this is a compare, I don't know what the actual branch following this is, or the move, uh, uh, I don't know what move it's doing afterwards, or jump afterwards. All I know is that it's doing the compare. So I see it's doing a compare, and then I go into the input file, replace any occurrence with equal, not equal, off by one, hopefully causing any branches or conditional operations afterwards to change. Now, how do I deal with the fact that I'm going to get a lot of false positives here, especially when I'm dealing with like a compare AL with BL when AL is 4.1? Like you're going to get a compare with 4.1 all the time and that 4.1 is probably not from the input file. Uh, sorry. Um, I don't know why it's... Uh, I'm going to try and see if I can get the size to be the correct the screen. Oh, why didn't I do that in the first place? Now you should be able to see the full full screen. Sorry about that. Um, so this is a really stupid solver, and I don't even want to call it a solver because it dis discredits anyone who actually does true solving because this is, this is, not, this is not solving. Um, but... What's really cool is that does it, this. I have seen this work in some cases where it's looking for some magic four-byte value in the file. Oh, you can't read it anymore. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh. Any, everyone else having problems reading it? I could change the font size or... Crap. Yeah, it should be readable full screen. 
but uh, so that's my basic uh, compare solving. I just call that my compare solver. And then I also have a mem compare solver. And uh, this is the same exact thing as the compare solver, just with mem compares. I see, hey, it's doing an 8 byte compare with something from the input file. And once again, I didn't actually track that that is from the input file. I just see that that 8 byte value is in the input file, and that's all I do, and I just assume it. And then um, I just set it up to, you know, either fail or pass the mem compare. That's it. Uh, this doesn't get me too much in most um, most things. Uh, in some embedded stuff that I've fuzzed, these compare solvers actually have done a lot. But in most uh, modern desktop stuff, these actually don't do too much. Mainly because you can have switch statements, and switch statements don't actually do a direct compare. They'll do a compare after some math and do some more math and more compares and more math and more compares. Uh, and I definitely am not following to that depth. So that's the basics of those solvers. Uh, someone asks, have I thought about integrating Z3 or some other s and lib? Absolutely. I would love to do that. And that's kind of part of some of the very big next steps. Those would be huge to start doing. And I would need to uh, integrate all memory tracking, taint tracking, and single stepping all these different things to monitor and trace variables through. Um, but I would love to have some processor mode for these like deep dives, or it could be another server that's responsible for doing s and solving to feedback, um, all these different things. That's all the basic solving I have right now, and it's really simple. Uh, how long are we going? Uh, we're probably not going to be going too much longer here. Uh, I could, I could ramble on for probably another two hours, but I'm going to try and wrap it up in the next 30 minutes, mainly so I can go get some Chipotle. Um, so, so I'll probably, probably wrap it up at uh, 9.30 p.m., so that will be uh, 40 minutes from now. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through these next, next bullets that I've uh, kind of came up with. Uh, so comparing results uh, from different snapshots. So uh, as I was asked earlier, how do I do any sort of triage? And this is one way I do triage. So as I mentioned above, I have, uh, I have eight NUMA nodes. And each NUMA node actually gets a different snapshot. I don't share the same snapshot between them, uh, with which each gets their own snapshot. Now keep in mind the snapshot is from the exact same point that I snapshotted all the other ones. It's just another snapshot. I could have rebooted the machine between snapshots. I could have closed the application, started it up. I could have crashed the application. I could have loaded the file in a different way. I could have changed the input file, all these different things. And the reason I would do this is to change the heap states, the ASLR state, the stack state, all these different things. And by doing this, now I have snapshots that are in different um, memory states, and this means now my crashes are going to uh, behave diff differently in different snapshots. And now I can start to relate the snapshots based on that. So I'm going to kind of elaborate on this. This is something I added about a month or two ago um, because I got a very tricky bug. I had a, uh, a stack uh, corruption bug that would show up in thousands of ways. So it's basically one bug, one core bug that would show up thousands of different PCs, thousands of different crashing addresses. It was just overwhelming. Just one bug that would cause all these different crashes. Now the problem is how do I automatically group these crashes together? So I came up with this uh, different snapshot. So now with eight different snapshots, I'll make kind of this tree. So let's say I have a crashing input and the hash for this crashing input is Elite. Uh, crashing input hash is leet. So I know that leet causes a crash. And like I was going through, I was fuzzing, and all of a sudden this input file caused a crash on one node. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to broadcast to all other nodes to run leet through. So basically, I'm saying, hey, I'm I'm Numa node number three. Uh, can you guys also take a look at this crash? Because 
it crashed this way on my node. And then what usually happens is, okay, so node zero crashed at, uh, uh, I don't know, lib plus 32, node one crashed at lib plus 32, node two crashed at lib plus 24, and node three didn't crash at all. There's no crash. So what's really cool is now again information. I can say, hey, the exact same input, because I know it's the same input, shows up different ways in different memory states. Uh, and what's cool is now I can start associating crashes with each other. So say we get another crash, and let's call this hash 3333. And we're going to call this, um, on node 0, it crashed at lib plus 64. Node 1 crashed at lib plus 32. Node 2, it didn't crash. And node 3 is lib plus, plus 8. So then with this information, I then group all of the related uh, crashes together. So I can now say, hey, 3333 and uh, leap have lib plus 32 in common. So now this isn't always perfect, and I'll go into how this isn't always perfect. But then basically I will group lib plus 32, lib plus 24, lib plus 64, lib plus 8, and no crash all together. So I'm going to say any of these crashes, they're all related. Uh, and then I can also say these come from leet and 3333. So um, this is something I added relatively recently, and it works pretty well with some exceptions. So this was able to take that 1,000 different crashes and basically, uh, from my level in my web interface, says, hey, you have one bug here. This is how it shows up in all these different ways, but it's one bug. Don't really go too in-depth into one of these 1,000 crashes because they're all roughly the same. So once I see that, then I pick whichever crash out of the 1,000 looks the most interesting, which one's a call, which one has a screwed up PC, which one's uh, reading ASCII, what's reading you know input ASCII, whatever, whatever. Um, so faults of this. Uh, concept. So how does this concept fall over? Now one very simple way that this falls over that uh, is relatively easy to see is what if lib plus 32 is uh, stack check or whatever, whatever the stack cookie check thing is. So now what I'm going to do is anything with lib plus 32 I'm going to group together with other crashes and if lib plus 32 is stack check or like debug break or any of these uh, things or uh, raise exception, ah. now what I've done is any bug that can show up in a stack check or debug break or raise exception now is all grouped together, which is not always what you want. So workarounds to this fault is blacklist. That's really all I can do. Um, with this simple of a concept that's this simple to implement, the only thing I can do is say, hey, this library offset, uh, this is a common routine, don't group things together. Uh, another thing here you could mention would be memcopy. Right? If a crash occurs in memcopy, which happens all the time, now every crash in memcopy, regardless of its origin of uh, original corruption, is now going to show up as one crash. So this is why this view that I have, this grouping view, is tunable. I can say, I don't want to view groups because I want to blindly assume everything is a unique crash. And then also, I want to see things as groups to kind of eh, give me a hint of, of what's related and what's not. This memcopy is a huge problem because now every single crash that shows up as a memcopy, which is many, many, many corruption crashes, are now grouped together. And now I have to undo all of that. Um, so that's kind of how I do uh, basic comparison and triage right now. I'm going to definitely add to this. Uh, what I'm going to do is add minimization. Right now I don't actually minimize uh, while fuzzing. What happens is I fuzz. And then once I've, once I've found, as a human, when I'm analyzing results, once I've analyzed uh, 
and said, hey, I want to see what the minimize input to this is, I then send it over to the hypervisor, it minimizes it down and gives me the smallest version. Um, if I integrate that with uh, fuzzing, what I could do is as it fuzzes and finds new crashes, it would then minimize those crashes down. And then I probably could write some algorithm that could compare inputs uh, or compare the uh, code flow uh, at branch level, function level, all these different things to basically relate crashes. Um, so uh, function flow. So let's say I have two different crashes and I minimize them down. Now, uh, we're gonna mark this as theory because this is not something I've implemented. It's not something I will know will work but I'm guessing it probably will. So let's say, uh, this is something I'm gonna probably be working on the next month. Let's say I have two crashes. Uh, minimize down the two crashes. So I take the two crashes that I had, minimize them down so they're now as simple as I can get them, or very close to as simple as I can get them. Then what I can do is I can uh, run each input through with full single stepping. So now I have full true tracing. I'm not doing the interrupt based stuff. I'm, I'm truly tracing through every single instruction that they execute. Now, yes, this is a 40 times slowdown, but when I'm doing this once every you know few minutes when I find a new crash, it really isn't that expensive. It's, it's actually probably, it wouldn't even hurt my performance numbers by 1%. So if I run through these with single stepping, I can now see uh, what branches are taken and what uh, calls are made. Now, obviously this is different fidelity. Branches, there's gonna be a lot more, and calls, there's gonna be a lot fewer. So one thing that would be fun would be uh, crash one goes, uh, let's say it calls A, which calls B, which returns up, uh, and then it calls C, and this is where it crashes. And then crash two does A to C, and this is where it crashes. So it's very difficult to write an algorithm that will determine, hey, there's something related here. Um, but hopefully, with enough time and enough thinking about it, I could come up with some algorithm that would take this trace of, of calls and branches and all these different things and try and relate minimize crashes. So once again, the minimization is key because when they're not minimized, there's gonna be so many calls and branches being taken that almost everything will look related because it will almost all look like random noise. But minimized down, they're probably gonna take very simple paths directly to their targets that are crashing. And then what I could probably do, a really simple thing would be um, make a set of all unique functions and compare the sets. And basically if, if 90% uh, of functions match, uh, assume the bugs are the same. And this would, you know, 90% is kind of tunable. It depends on how much code is shared between uh, in like a normal run. And that's something you could probably distill down by uh, running through like your initial input file and then comparing your non-crashing input to your crashing input and then using that as a baseline. Look for something that's a few standard deviations outside of the norms of what you would expect for uh, related paths. So that's kind of a statistical approach. This, once again, this is all theoretical. I have no idea if this will work, but this is this is how I think. I'm kind of exposing like what my mindset is of, of the next steps. Uh, the other thing I want to hit on is, um, I'm just making a note. Um, Yes, yes, it was brought up that I don't need single stepping for that, I can do full branch t tracing, which is true, yes. Uh, it'd be a little bit faster. Uh, single stepping, yeah, I could do taint slicing, all these different things. Um, and depending on the, uh, whatever I'm fuzzing, um, it might be pretty easy to, like, uh, some things will inherently just parse things linearly, where they're just gonna have a pointer to whatever they're parsing at the time, and they just go through bite by bite in some state machine. Uh, what's cool about that is if you do single stepping, you can kind of watch where it's advancing and keep note of like, uh, okay, we hit a new branch, this is where we crashed, this is where the pointer into the input file was. Or 
here's the last thing we read. Even I could even do that without uh, single stepping. Is I could say, hey, this was the last memory access we had before we crashed, uh, which is very important because if it's from the input file, then it's like, or this was the last thing read out of the input file before the crash. And I could try and associate that and uh, try and find relations between, hey, these two things read the same thing from the input file, and that's when they both crashed. Um, so what's cool about this function flow, like relation stuff, is if there is a path where, say, it goes a, b, c, mem compare, or mem copy, and then another does a, d, uh, f, mem copy, uh, depending on whatever your threshold is here, you're going to say these are two different bugs. Whereas currently, I would say they're the same bug. Um, so this would get me a little bit more fidelity on how bugs are related. Uh, obviously, there's more and more I can do. This is this is kind of what I want to do. I, you know, obviously, this is a problem that a lot of people work on. A lot of people do it different ways. This is just kind of the way that I would do it next. Uh, I can make it more and more advanced, but this is like the next step, in my opinion. So we're going to go into a next step, which is logic bugs. Um, how do I detect logic bugs from a uh, fuzzer standpoint? And the way I would have to do this, I would, I would have to make uh, special tracing and breakpoints. So uh, one example of this would be, uh, let's say, a load library. Right? Um, put a breakpoint on load library and see if user inputs is present in the uh, file name. Really simple, really basic. Rare that you're going to see it, but we all know it happens. Um, it's just something that would never hurt to have. Another thing, you put a breakpoint on load library, which gets called so infrequently in a fuzzing context that it doesn't cost anything to have a breakpoint on it that you then do some analysis. But if you were to find a load library that you controlled or you could escape or you could uh, truncate or do any of these things, holy crap, you're, you're probably already done and you've got a 100% reliable bug. Um, other things uh, that kind of come to mind would be like uh, probe and lock pages in the Windows kernel uh, where the address is user, uh, user address, but access mode is kernel mode. And what this is saying is, hey, you somehow gave it a an address, and whatever kernel module is accessing your address as kernel mode, which means now you can pass it a kernel address, and now it's going to read or write kernel memory that it shouldn't be. Um, so little things like this, like this, um, usually going to have to be manually implemented as uh, plugins. Right, so this is something I just want to do. A common function is that you want to look for uh, why is there user data here? Is this being called in a context it shouldn't? Is user data flowing to a function it shouldn't? Uh, uh, in ways that are cheap to check. So just kind of a list of, of things to add. Uh, you know, even something like this is, is what you do is you're doing static analysis. So like, think of what you would do with static analysis. You're scrolling through, you're looking for stir copies, you're looking for uh, incorrect permission flags, you're looking for uh, things that are going to a stack, all these all these different things. So I'd love to make special cases for that. Um, really nothing too technical there, it's just something to keep in mind, like, hey, if you're writing a fuzzer, put some breakpoints on some common functions and, and monitor them. You know, what if what if you get an exec VE call for a user input? Like, whew, you're happy. Uh, Memory coverage. I'm kind of running a little bit low on time, so I'm going to go through these last few pretty quickly. So memory coverage, uh, as I described uh, above, I guess I get three uh, load, store, and uh, decodes. So with instruction-based sampling, I get three decodes of whether or not I'm loading or storing and what address I'm loading or storing. I do not, however, get what I'm loading or storing. I would need a disassembler to do that. So. What's cool about this is I can track what memory is being written and read from. And even more specifically, I can track what blocks are making 
these accesses, which is really cool. Because uh, imagine a scenario where you have a very common block that you hit almost every single fuzz case, but it's got an integer overflow or an out of bounds, actually an integer overflow is a terrible example, an out of bounds uh, reader or write. Um, so in my case, I'm probably not going to focus too much on that block because my code coverage is inherently going to drive me towards fuzzing things that are uh, unique and uncommon. And, and what if there's a bug in a common path? So that's where this memory coverage comes in. I've implemented the absolute memory coverage, but I haven't gotten to the relative memory co coverage. And I want to say the absolute memory coverage is a complete waste of time and a piece of crap and not worthwhile. And the reason for that is absolute memory changes. Your heap state changes. Your stack location changes. Your ASLR state changes. And with all of these different changes, you can't really compare addresses because they're, they're completely random, pretty much. Uh, you know. So what could you do instead? You could do relative memory coverage uh, by using stack and heap awareness. So if I were to add something to my fuzzer where I would be able to track all heap uh, and stack creations, expansions, realics, freeze, all these different things, I would be able to keep a database of what the heap looks like. Or I could write something that could parse the heap because, you know, that's doable as well. I could just simply use Windows heap and parse that. But what's really cool is even if I get a different address, so let's say we have a move racks of 100, and then we have a move racks of OX uh, 200. Uh, let's actually change that. Let's do 100 plus 0 and 100 plus 200 plus 0. So um, let's say these are two different runs, and one, uh, some heap address is 100, and this one heap address is 200, right? So we have two different allocations, and this is going to show up as two different memory accesses. However, if we keep track of uh, heap state, what we could say is uh, address 100 belongs to allocation at base 100 of 20 byte length. And then what we could say is, OK, so uh, so this access is oh, zero bytes relative to the um, access. Now you could maybe say, hey, why don't you just use the offset in the access, the memory access? Um, but that's not always possible, because keep in mind, it could have done the math somewhere else. It could have added to a pointer, or it could be looping and processing data. So eh, it's not terribly useful. Uh, another question is, what if this address false? So, um, and it is out of bounds of our heap info. How can we tell? Well, this is kind of an interesting example of like, um, what, what if this was 100 plus 100? And now we think it's 200, which is out of bounds of where it's actually supposed to be reading or writing. And now we just think it belongs to another heap. Well, we way we can prevent this like false positive is the page heap. Make it so it would fault. And now we have a crash we want. The whole point of this is to get a new crash or more crashes. So if we get a crash, we don't really care. So at that point in time, we don't we don't really care if we get a false positive if we got our crash because that's what we were looking for. But how does this evolve? Uh, so the way I'd look at this is saying, let's say we have this move racks RBX. And we've seen this RBX uh, 100 times uh, RBX has been uh, plus OX10. So 100 times we have seen, out of the times we've done code coverage on this block, we've seen RBX get access. Uh, relative 10 to some heap allocation. And 10 times it's been plus OX 20, and then one time it has been plus OX 1000. 
And what's cool is we could now start feeding this info even deeper into our code coverage and say, hey, we hit this block very frequently. We, we've seen this basic block a lot. However, we've only seen a memory access that goes 1,000, 4,096 bytes out of the, inside this heap allocation, we've only seen it once. So even though it's an un, even though it's a common block, we have an uncommon memory access. So then instead of feeding in the code coverage for this block generically, we'd specifically feed in the code coverage for this block with the least common memory accesses. Um, so, uh, I don't know, does that make sense? I'm still kind of thinking through how this would all work. Um, obviously, you have problems. You're kind of guessing, hey, this allocation is relative this from the heap. But if the heap is in good state, um, you should be fine. And as the hypervisor, I would store the heap metadata such that I would not be worried about my heap metadata getting corrupt uh, because it would be stored out of band outside of access to the VM. So I would truly know what the heap state would look like even if the program corrupted its heap internals. Um, so this is something I really want to get into. Um, I can say uh, from experience that code coverage only works to a point. Code coverage is somewhat correlated with the amount of crashes you're going to get, or more specifically, the amount of unique crashes you're going to get. But it's not directly correlated. Eventually, they start to decorrelate. Eventually, you just start finding new code, but you're not actually finding new crashes. They're still they're still correlated. I shouldn't say they decorrelate. I'm saying they, uh, it's not like for every ten blocks you find, you're going to find a new crash. Uh, eventually, you just start uncovering code that, you know, maybe isn't even touching your input anymore. So uh, I would say stressing entirely on code coverage is definitely not a good way to approach a fuzzer. I think code coverage is important. You should have feedback. You should be thinking about it. It's a great way of seeing if your fuzzer is improving coverage because it's otherwise you're working blind. You have no idea if you're hitting more code. But it is definitely not the only number you should care about. And this is kind of my way of can I change it by uh, bringing in other coverage? Heap coverage, stack coverage, uh, memory coverage, register coverage, function coverage, all these different things. Uh, what else? Can we use single stepping and true code coverage to benefit? Uh, we've kind of already gone through this, so I'm going to actually delete that. Uh, that's basically, yes, we can have other cores designated towards kind of these deep dives where they're doing true memory coverage and going through and trying to find every single in and out of the program and then do more analysis on that. And I think we hit really good points uh, where that uh, will help uh, in this like function flow and triage. Because I would honestly say, and I know this is going to sound stupid, but triage is probably one of the most important parts of fuzzing. Because you are going to likely have more crashes than you have time to minimize, analyze, root cause. So if you can have something automatically root cause the 10,000 crashes you have down to 10 core crashes, you've just saved weeks, if not months of time. I would... I would honestly say that is worth almost more time than your fuzzers and harnesses themselves. Um, stack walking. So this is kind of a fun concept, uh, which is simply uh, write a stack walker similar to KE or BT in Windybug slash TDB. Uh, and this is something I could do on crashes on, uh, honestly, it's a cheap enough operation that I probably could do it on my uh, interrupt sampling or on my uh, basic block sampling. And basically what here, all I would do is uh, with code coverage, store the stack uh, walk that caused us to get here. And the point of this is yet another way of determining unique paths. I'm already doing, I'm not technically doing basic block coverage, I'm doing edge coverage such that a call to multiple different sites will register as uh, different, um, different edges rather than just one block, uh, which is very important. Um, however, uh, it would be great to even further expand on it by saying, hey, we're getting uh, kind of similar to above with this mem copy. Hey, we're getting a mem copy call but we're getting memcopy called from a completely different context than we've ever seen before. 
you know, we get memcopy called all the time, and we're going to, in, in terms of our code coverage, we're going to treat a memcopy call as the exact same thing every time. We're going to be like, hey, we saw a memcopy for the billionth time. Who cares? But if you just hit a memcopy in a function that you've never hit before, it's kind of kind of important. Uh, although, I will say with code coverage, you will see that that function itself was a unique hit, and you'll still get down that same path just due to the fact that the function is. Um, but there are edge cases where, hey, this uh, this very specific path caused us to hit a memcopy. Where now the path of the stack walk is important. Um, the stack walk also is helpful in triage. Report the stack walk with uh, your crashes such that you can very quickly see, hey, how deep is our stack? Um, so that's kind of something, uh, I don't know, I just kind of tacked that on there. It's, it's something I want to add. It doesn't take too much time to add, but it would make triage a little bit easier. Um, but I think that kind of covers all of the basic parts I was going into. So there's some stuff at the top I think I wrote down. Code coverage, memory coverage, debugging, sim single stepping, we hit that pretty well. Uh, networking, currently I use that 10 gigabit uh, custom transfer protocol on UDP. Um, I'm working on getting uh, 60, uh, 56 gigabit InfiniBand support with remote DMA, and that will make this a lot more scalable, such that I'll be able to spin up multiple nodes and they'll be able to very cheaply share the code coverage database by atomically updating each other's RAM. Uh, and the more bandwidth I have, the more I can have reported to another server for processing. Because like I said, my whole goal is to eventually make it so I have one fuzz server that feeds into analysis servers that do a lot of solving, whether it be SMT, whether it be uh, actually single stepping through it and then feeding it back into the fuzzer to make it fuzz even better. So, or looking through for new logic things, there, there's tons of things I can do here. Um, so the more more network bandwidth I have, the more willing I am to use it. Because uh, right now I'm really not using the whole 10 gigabit, but if I had 56 gigabit InfiniBand, I'd probably start using 20, 30 gigabit of constant uh, use. So, um, but I think I've kind of hit all the main topics I wanted to go through. Any any questions here? Anything that stands out? I want to wrap up in the next like eight minutes so I can grab some Chipotle and then uh, I'm just curious if there are any any questions. Any design decisions, future design decisions, anything that didn't really make sense. Uh, I understand I went through this pretty quick. This has been a, I think, what did I start at? Seven, so it's been two and a half hours. So I've gone through a lot of stuff really quick. I've kind of assumed you know what a lot of these uh, OS internal things are. And, uh, you know, as I said, I would love to open source this. I'm going to have to clean up the code, make it better, and eventually, uh, yeah, maybe I will open source it. Um, how do I debug Fulkervisor to develop it? Uh, do I do it in a VM? I very, uh, at the very start of Fulkervisor, I use Box, B-O-C-H-S, which is similar to QMU, uh, and I use that to set up the SVM and uh, VTX support, because it's, uh, when you initially get into hypervisor development, it's very confusing. As you get further on, you realize, hey, the hardware gives you a little bit more information about, oh crap, your hypervisor is not working, this is why. Um, but when you're initially starting, it's hard to really know uh, what it's doing. So Box helped me out a lot. I made modifications to it to print out a little bit more um, verbose messages, and uh, that's what I did. But I no longer really can run any of the Sunbox because it's so memory and compute intensive. Uh, like my standard, my standard spin up and run of Fulkervisor is probably 250 or 300 gigabytes of RAM, which is just completely infeasible for Box to really test. Um, it also doesn't support the network driver I use. So currently the only way that I get debug info is I've installed, for all exceptions at hypervisor level, I've installed exception handlers that will simply store all of the, um, store all of the processor state 
and some of the stack in a structure and then send it over the network. So all I'll see is on the network where I like get my fuzz results popping up, you know, every second it tells me what my new coverage and number of fuzz cases per second and all these things. All of a sudden it'll be like, hey, one of your cores decided to div by zero. And it's really up to me then to quickly go through and try and determine what is broken. Um, the development on Falkervisor is so iterative that usually if there is a crash or a problem, it usually shows up almost instantly, and it's probably something I changed in the last hour such that I can quickly back out and or determine what the problem was just kind of guessing. It's definitely not a very friendly debug environment. I'm not able to step through it. Uh, I could add support for that, but I just really haven't had a need. Um, so the other thing is, how long have I been working on Falkervisor? So Falkervisor on AMD I've been working full on since, uh, actually pretty much since New Year's. So I guess eight months uh, on and off. I spend a lot of time sometimes switching between doing Falkervisor cleanup and Falk OS stuff. Uh, and uh, so basically, yeah, about eight months because I got my AMD server in January. So. And then from, I think, October to December is how long I worked on Brownie with uh, Intel VTX. So basically, I spent probably about three months last year learning how to do Intel and AMD hypervisors, and then about eight months this year doing pretty, pretty much strictly dev. Um, what are my thoughts on hacking up KVM or Beehive or something to do something similar? I think that is the absolute correct way to go. What I have done here is not the right way to go. I'm not borrowing code. I'm rewriting so many things from scratch, reinventing so many wheels. I don't get disk. I don't get snapshots of I.O. devices. There's so much that you could benefit and gain from by using something that already exists or even QMU. Um, QMU would probably be slower, but you'd get some of the devices. Um, so yes, this is another reason why I haven't open sourced this is because I know I've done this fundamentally wrong. I've done this because I enjoy it and I'm learning. It's also turned out to work relatively well, um, but it's definitely not uh, not the right way to go. And I, I recognize that about most of my work, but I have fun doing it. And if you ask me to hack up Beehive or Box or, or KVM to do something like this, I I probably won't get nearly as much done. Um, would Intel's PT extension be a suitable replacement for IBS? Absolutely. I'm already looking at Intel processors for my next build. The only thing is PT is not yet supported under a VM. I don't know if you read that, but it's uh, in, the, in the documentation they say it's not supported under a VM. If anyone isn't familiar, PT is Intel processor trace. Uh, I think they say it's about a 10 or 20% slowdown. What you do is you tell the processor, hey, use this memory region to store all branch uh, information, whether it be uh, interrupts, whether it be calls, whether it be returns, just store all the branch traces at this memory location. And what's cool about that is if you have 512 gigs of RAM, you can give it a 200 gig buffer to log memory or to log traces to, which gets you basically free tracing uh, with you know, 10, 20% slowdown versus a 40 to 60 times slowdown with single stepping or 20 times slowdown with branch stepping. Um, sadly, that's not supported yet under a VM, uh, but they are saying that is something they want to improve. I have no idea when they're planning on getting that out, um, but I'm gonna keep my eye on that because yes, I will gobble that up in a heartbeat. Uh, the other thing is I'm looking at power eight uh, IBM and Tyan both are making Power 8 boards now, uh, and sure it won't be great for, like right now Falkervisor is great because I can run it on Windows, run it on Word, run it on things that I don't have source to, um, but I would love to run something on Power 8 because I think there are some debugging features that are better. I don't know what they are, I know they've been hinted to, I need to get the technical document documentation and read through it. Uh, but once again, that would limit me to only open source stuff that I could build for Power 8 and then fuzz on there. Um, uh, by the same token, uh, what about ARM's ETM or PTM? I am not familiar at all with ETM or PTM, nor am I familiar with ARM hypervisor development. 
So I can't answer that question for you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll try and do some looking into that and see if I can find out more about that. Um, what else? Uh, there's another thing. I'm, I'm kind of running out of time. I'm going through a big... Uh, one, one reason I can't really do any demos right now is I'm going through a big architecture change with Vulcarvisor. Uh, previously, what it would do, as I said, is it would boot up and it would load the snapshot over the network. What I'm actually going to do is it's going to fetch the register state and then it's going to boot into a VM without memory, which will cause it to immediately fault on a page table access. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to only request memory from the server when I need it and then cache it. So basically I'm going to boot up a VM with no memory and then it's going to fault because hey, it doesn't have the page table and then it's going to fault later because hey, I don't have PC. But eventually I'm slowly going to pull over and cache the physical memory I need for that. And what's great is that this will hopefully, it, I may fail, we'll see, hopefully what this will allow me to do is have a 256 gigabyte VM and run eight of them, or 64 of them on one machine, because likely when you're fuzzing something, sure you have a 256 gig VM, but it's probably only reading and writing a few of those gigs, maybe one or two. And um, so I'm gonna add copy on write. So basically any VM that shares uh, the same pages that are not written to will all share the same NUMA local for performance reasons, NUMA local copy. Um, I'm also going to dedupe pages such that uh, the way this caching is going to be done is based on hashing. So if there's, you know, all null pages will be treated the same. So if I say, hey, I want to, I want a null page, it's like, hey, I already have a cached. I'll just map it to this. And then once someone actually goes to write that memory, then I will page fault out, change it, you know, standard copy and write. Uh, so it's a big architecture change I'm going through right now, but the hopes, the hopes of that are that I can get huge VMs running under, um, uh, and many of them running, even though I don't have memory to support them. And the only reason I want these huge VMs is since I don't have that disk stuff, it allows me to have more cache. So Windows will see, hey, I have 256 gigs of uh, RAM, so it will cache things a little bit uh, more frequently. So, you know, the file that it was like, yeah, I don't really have room to cache, it will cache it now, and that will now be part of my snapshot but I hopefully won't bring over the whole snapshot. So we'll see if that actually works. I don't know. Uh, I was doing some experimentation with differential snapshots. So for example, if you tell Windows that it has 256 gigs of v uh, RAM and you boot up, it uses about 130 gigs. Not it uses it like it's in use, but it touches such that it marks them as dirty about 130 gigs. I was hoping that I would be able to give it 200 gigs of RAM and just boot it up and it only touched like four or eight gigs and then I just snapshot the four or eight gigs. Uh, that was kind of a failure and didn't turn out to be the case. But so instead I'm gonna switch over to this like caching only only fetch memory when you need it rather than pulling the little snapshot. So we'll see if that pays out. Uh, I'll probably try and have that wrapped up and then after that I'm gonna look at uh, some of the logic bug stuff, the function flow stuff, and then memory coverage kind of in that order. So that's kind of the current future plan for it. So uh, anyways, I got to go get some food before uh, places close up, but I hope you like this. Uh, I'll probably do some more of these uh, once in a while when I get things to change. Um, once again, I'd love to make this stuff open source if I can clean it up or make it better, make it usable. It is, I mean, IPs, MAC addresses and crap are hard coded in there right now. It is not something that people want to use. Um, also, another reason why I don't open source it is I kind of want to encourage people to do this correctly, write it in C, write it cross-platform, adopt Zen, adopt KVM, don't freaking do it from scratch, because um, this is not the right way to go. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I got to head out, and uh, I'm going to quickly throw this up on Pastebin, and uh, and uh, I'll post it in Falkervisor and... Uh, Oops, Pastebin thinks I'm a bot. So I'm going to post this uh, in Twitch chat as well as in Fulcrovisor and LiveCTF. Uh, and uh, anyways, I'm going to head out and grab some food. Hope you guys liked it. Uh, feel free to join Pound Fulcrovisor, the channel on Freenode or LiveCTF, quite frankly. Just find me. My name's Gamozo. It's pretty unique. Uh, find me uh, really anywhere. Feel free to ask me questions. I, I, Usually love feedback. I don't care how stupid you think the question is. It's uh, 
you know, there's a lot of learning curve to all this, and uh, I'm under the impression that it's really not too hard to learn, and I think it's more that uh, people need to be taught about simple ways to do it and how simple it is, rather than uh, worry about, like, oh, no, I shouldn't do a hypervisor. That sounds complex, because it really isn't. So, cool. I hope you guys liked it, and uh, see you later.